um, it doesn't, it, the, verb, the verb doesn't change. The other point, thing I point out is that the prophet was unlettered. And um, so I don't think he sat back when this verse was revealed and said, well, let me see, is this verb transitive or intransitive? He understood it to mean go away because when he had difficulty with his wives, that's exactly what he did. He went away. So the sunnah of the prophet is to go away from the wives and let the situation subside and then go back to them. And um, the, and we know from the uh, sunnah and the traditions that the prophet never beat anyone. So he, this is how he understood the word. So a lot of this is all communicated from the scribes. The scribes actually wrote everything down. But the prophet went over it with them every year during the month of fasting. He would spend time with the scribes going over the verses that they had written down. Then within 20 years of the prophet's death, it was compiled into a book form from those pieces that it had been written on, you know, like the bone or or parchment or whatever different things they had written verses on. It seems that we're living at a time where there are new translations of the holy books. I'm interviewing Daniel Matt at the end of this month, Uh who is redoing the Kabbalah, the Zohar, translating the Zohar directly from Aramaic. Oh, isn't that wonderful? He's got six volumes done and probably another six to go. Oh, that's excellent. And it's a painstaking task, very much like what yours has been. Yes. Of galactic proportion. Oh, that is so wonderful. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, that's very exciting. And by the way, the person who sponsored that project is from Chicago. Oh, who who was it? (laughs) The Pritzkers did that. Priskers, yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, so this is very exciting. There's going to be so much difference in, in that uh, translation as compared to from the, was it originally in the Greek or Hebrew? It's or? originally in Hebrew, but again, it's all about the translators adding things, to, yes. you know, which I think is great. And he has great spiritual integrity, and he's going to go back and meticulously go through it with a fine tooth comb. And I just think that kind of dedication, like the kind that you have, yes. is unparalleled. Yes, yeah, it's so important, absolutely for us to be able to get things straight. (laughs) I found out about you through the mosque in New York. Oh, okay. And originally, I think I saw a Twitter update from you, and that's how I found out about your work. Oh, yeah. And very, very, very excited. I want you to talk a little bit about, if you wouldn't mind, the Enneagram and explain to the audience what the Enneagram is. And if you could share something about the Moral Healer's Handbook, The Psychology of Spiritual Chivalry, God's Will Be Done. Yes. Well, the... um the uh, Sufi, the Enneagram, the way it's being used today, uh, it originally began with the Sufi integration of the of the ancient wisdom. And um, at, the, at the beginning in the 80s, when the Enneagram was becoming popular, people were willing to write in their uh, books that on the history of the Enneagram that it did come from the Sufi tradition. But as um, you know, Islam became more and more denigrated in the words of, you know, so forth, that then people decided that they're going to totally ignore where it had come from originally and um, and make up and kind of uh, do their own thing uh, from the oral tradition. They considered it to be oral tradition. So today, in today's world, a person goes and becomes a number in the Enneagram, whether you're Don Richard Rousseau or... Um, Helen Palmer, or whoever your teacher is, but each one of the teachers have a different definition because of copyright. So, you know, how many ways can you describe a person and their personality? They've all had to do, you know, different ways and so forth and so on. But the original of it came from a man named Oscar Ichazo, who was from um, Bolivia, I believe. And um, he said, well, we've got nine numbers here. So we'll take the seven uh, vices, uh, you know, of the ca- in the Catholic tradition, and we'll add two, lust and anger. Well, that's that completely distorted the original origins of it, and it may work for some people because any sometimes anything works, or there's also the placebo effect of things working. But the uh, Sufi, what the Sufi enneagram is all about, is that at any moment in time, any one of us could be one of those numbers. I mean, we could be showing jealousy, we could be showing inappropriate anger, we could be showing uh, cowardice, and we could uh, be showing a lack of self-esteem in our response to any kind of a situation. So we're all, all those nine numbers. And the goal in the Sufi Enneagram is to reach the center point, which is zero, which is to be someone who is an egoless person who 
has learned to be fair and just. So within the Sufi tradition, anything that preceded Islam, uh, you know, like the whole Egyptian world or Greek world or Chinese world or Indian world, anything that preceded Islam in the 7th century is accepted into the Islamic tradition as long as it doesn't go against the oneness of God. That's why the Torah and the Gospels and so forth and so on are accepted within the Islamic tradition, as well as, um, you know, all of the, the Hindu tradition or the Buddhist tradition and so forth. So uh, Plato and Aristotle was, were considered to be a monotheist, and Plato had what he considered to be the four virtues of courage, temperance, wisdom, and justice. So those were then the basic um, coordinates of this uh, circle. I don't know if you've seen the Enneagram diagram. Yes, Yes, I have. Yeah, okay. So these are the four virtues that a person tries to attain. And these four virtues are in the inside of the circle, but the nine points are on either on the circle or on the outside of the circle. So you're trying to move towards courage, or you're trying to move towards wisdom or temperance. And then once you have held uh, courage in moderation or in balance or wisdom in balance or temperance in balance, then you're towards the center and you become a fair and just person. But only if another person says to you, you know, that was a very fair thing that you did. That decision you made was very fair. You didn't consider your own um, personal, I mean, your own personal opinion in this. uh, So I would call you a fair and just person. Then you know that you've attained um, you know, that center point and that zero point. And those nine points on the circumference are it's someone who has too much or too little of courage. Now, someone who has too much is reckless. Someone who has too little is cowardly. And the same is true of wisdom. Someone who has too much is a hypocrite. Someone who has too little is ignorant of, and of course, because this was a religious symbol, it's ignorant of the existence of God or a hypocrite is someone who's too much doubtful about God. And there were these six points, um, which are uh, too much or too little, which are based in terms of quantity, like, you know, too much or too little. But it was in the 13th century when one of the Islamic uh, Neoplatonists, his name was Nasr al-Din Tusi, and he said, well, you know, when you're talking about too much or too little, you're talking about quantity. But actually, you can be lacking these four virtues in terms of quality as well. So that became three more added, three more points, and those became the nine points on the edge of the of the of the uh, circle. And uh, so you can have two. Um, you can be lacking in terms of quality of wisdom, and then you become someone who's ungrateful to God. Or you could be lacking in terms of courage, uh, the quality of courage. And then you're a person who, for instance, is uh, fearful of anything other than God. So this was the the basic. These are the basic ideas behind the Sufi enneagram, and it's it's got layers and it's built upon layers. So the first layer is the human soul, which is divided into the passions and reason. The passions consist of lust and anger, and the and uh, the top part of this uh, circle it represents reason. So uh, reason leads to wisdom. Lust, when you have it in control, leads to temperance. And uh, courage, when you have um, anger in control and moderation, then that leads to courage. So it all keeps, you know, it keeps building and stemming from the same idea. But then what happens is Rumi uh, said that, uh, so you have to use reason over your passions. The whole idea is to reason with yourself. Why was I jealous again? I have well, that person. I have to go and apologize. And after you've done that several times and apologized, um, you then uh, remember yourself and say, I'm not going to do that again. Uh, I'm not, I don't feel like apologizing again. I, and I know I would have to do that in order to morally heal. So that's basically the concept behind the uh, Moral Healer's Handbook. But the then the virtues uh, are re- the vices are replaced with in the, within the Islamic tradition with the most beautiful names of God, which are also divided into three um, parts depending on the courage, wisdom, or temperance. So um, as you develop towards becoming a fair and just person, you also um, are developing the names of God like forgiveness, repentance, acceptor of repentance, or 
compassion.